Right, thank you, Chair. We are live and ready to start the meeting. OK. Uh, good evening, members, officers, and any members of the public who are viewing the live stream of this meeting. Welcome to the meeting of the Joint Local Plan Advisory Group. My name is Councillor Dr. Tumi Hawkins, and I am the chair of the group. The Joint Local Plan Advisory Group is a non-decision-making group comprising of members of Cambridge City Council, South Cambridgeshire District Council, and Cambridgeshire County Council. And its role is to provide a stare at member level for the development of land use plans integrated with transport strategy. We meet in public and our recommendations go back to the local planning authority for decision making. This meeting is being administered by South Cambridgeshire District Council and all of the papers from this meeting can be found on the website. Members, I will now invite each of you to introduce yourselves. When your name is called, please would you unmute yourself, uh, unmute and introduce yourself. And as I stated earlier, my name is Councillor Dr. Tumi Hawkins. My vice chair is Councillor Katie Thumbra. Katie? Hello, I'm Councillor Katie Thornborough. I'm a Petersfield Ward Councillor and the Executive Councillor for Planning and Transport at Cambridge City. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Tim Bick, if he's here yet. I don't think so. I don't think I see him. Uh, in which case, Councillor Neil Shaler. Hello, yes, I'm Neil Shaler. I'm the uh, County Councillor for the Romsey Division, and I'm um, also Vice Chair of Highways on County. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Peter Sanford. Thank you, Chair. Peter Sanford, War Councillor for Caxton and Papworth Ward in South Cambridge. Chair. Thank you. Councillor Simon Smith. Hello, I'm, I'm Councillor Simon Smith representing Castle Ward in Cambridge City. Thank you. And Councillor Dr Richard Williams. Thank you, Chair. I'm Richard Williams. I'm the member for Whittlesford in South Cambridgeshire. Thank you. Uh, now, do we have any other members present? Anyone else? Doesn't look like it. Oh. I see a hand up. Uh, Councillor Pippa Halings. Thanks very much. So, yes, Councillor Pippa Halings and member for Histon Nimbington and Orchard Park. Welcome. Uh, also, Councillor Martin Smart. Yeah, hello. So, I'm one of the councillors in King of Sedges and I'm chair of planning committee in the city. Nice to see you. Welcome. Uh, Councillor Farnbro, I see your hand up. Yes. I just want to say a councillor Bick is here. He is here. Okay. Yes, I'm sorry. I couldn't get any sound earlier on, but I am here and I represent Market Ward on the City Council. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Bick. Welcome. <laughs> Good to see you. And um, also we have a number of officers joining us this evening. Uh, we have Jonathan Dixon, the Planning Policy Manager at the Shared Planning Service, at the Greater Cambridge Shared Planning Service, uh, who will be leading the meeting with support from other officers. Uh, John, could you kindly introduce yourself, please, and inform us of who you have on hand to assist with the meeting? Uh, thank you, Councillor Hawkins. We've got uh, quite a range of officers with us today, uh, reflecting the range of officers in the themes we're going to be looking at. So I'm going to go down my list. Alphabetically, I've got uh, Bruce Waller, who's a principal policy officer in the policy team. Char Charlotte Morgan Shelbourne, who's a policy officer in the team. Kieran Davies, another policy officer in the team. And I've got Emma Davies, who works uh, on sustainability, sustainability issues, helping us with the local plan. Uh, we've got Liz Lizzie Wood, a senior policy officer in the team. And we've got Matt. Patterson, who works with the team as a consultant working on infrastructure issues. And I think I've picked up everybody. 
Well, that's quite a team. Thank you, everyone, for all the work that you've done, um, you know, on, uh, on the uh, draft local plan so far. And uh, we're obviously very keen to hear, um, you know, on topics that we'll be discussing this evening. But before we do that, I see Councillor Smart's hand is still up. Councillor Smart, did you have something you wanted to say? Or that was a... Um, no, no, sorry, that's a mistake. Apologies. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Right. Um, now for apologies. Um, any Anyone absent? May I ask our Democratic Services Officer Lawrence if there's any apologies for today? Uh, thank you, Chair, and good evening, everyone. Pleased to announce we have a full house with no apologies this evening. Good. Always nice to have a full house. Right. Um, now is if uh, any members have any interests to declare in relation to any of the items of business on this agenda? Ah, Councillor Williams. Councillor Williams? Yes, yeah. Chair, thanks. Um, I just want to note that um, the university that is my employer has commented on uh, various aspects in the plan, so I just wanted to note that. Okay, thank you. Um, if any other uh, interest subsequently becomes apparent during the meeting, then please just let us know at that time, okay? That's not smart, I can still see your hand up. Thanks. I can't I can't seem to get it down on my screen, so apologies for that. You have to <laughs> that with it. Uh, oh, yeah. all right then. Okay. Um, the next item is the minutes of the previous meeting. So, members? Um, the minutes for approval have been published as a supplementary document. And this was for a meeting held on the 21st of November, where mm -hmm. homes and wellbeing and social inclusion were covered. Have you had sight of them? Yes? Okay. Uh, does anyone wish to make any amendments to these minutes, please? Mm, I'll take that as a no. In which case, can I take the approval of these minutes by affirmation, please? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Right, now to business. We now come to uh, the item covering the infrastructure and job section of the local plan. And at this point, I will ask uh, John Dixon to introduce the item, please. Over to you, John. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, the team is going to present the item uh, <laughs> for me. Um, we're going to take you through uh, two main sections today. We're going to talk about the um, representations received uh, on the local plan for first proposals in relation to the infrastructure theme. Um, and then we're going to take you through the jobs theme. And for each theme, we're going to go through um, what the a brief reminder of what the proposals were in the consultation, then some of the feedback and also some of the next steps. And then under each section, there'll be a, an opportunity for member discussion where officers will be interested to hear uh, uh, member views and feedback. So I'll hand over the team at that point. OK, thank you. Um, so. Bruce Waller here, I'm going to introduce um, the chapter on jobs um, and there'll be a number of my colleagues who will also be presenting a number of the policies. Um, so without and that will that will involve. So I will cover um, the intro to the jobs uh, following by the new employment and development proposals policy. Then I'll be handing over to my colleague Kieran. Uh, followed by Lizzie, then through to Charlotte, and then back to myself. And then after that, there'll be um, a discussion point. So without further ado, um, so the jobs um, section, um, this really covers the kind of overarching um, uh, work stream for jobs, of which the aim was to encourage a flourishing and mixed economy in Cambridge, for Greater Cambridge, which included a wide range of jobs while maintaining our area's global reputation for innovation. Um, 
While some respondents supported the overarching aim of the policies, a few stated that more emphasis needed to be placed on the rural economy, um, with some groups perceived that the forecasted jobs figures to be too high. Others considered that the plan should better promote the high technology clusters, logistics and life sciences sectors. So focusing on the first policy, uh, JNE, new employment and development proposals, um, the national planning policy requires plans to help create the conditions in which businesses can invest, expand and adapt. Uh, and this policy um, has the principal aim of setting out the criteria that will determine whether proposals for employment development in urban areas, villages and the countryside are acceptable. Uh, so in terms of comments, again, the policy attracted support from a wide range of groups. However, some developers and landowners perceived the policy to be too restrictive, specifically in relation to logistics, space, education facilities and high technology clusters. Uh, and a few respondents criticised the policy, arguing there was already enough employment in the area. I'm now going to hand over to my colleague here in dealing with supporting the rural economy. Hi, uh, yeah, good evening, everyone. Um, so, yeah, so th this this policy uh, sets out the approach to uh, the reuse and replacement of rural buildings and um, proposals related to land based enterprises and compared to other policies in the, in the in the batch, it didn't attract a lot of uh, representations. Um, University of Cambridge and a few parish councils supported the policy. Um, there were a couple of representations that uh, recommended widening the policy scope um, to you know, really encourage uh, the reuse of, um, of buildings that provided quite specific feedback. And um, one, one uh, developer also recommended protecting small rural employment sites. Um, and related to the third bullet point, although it wasn't related to the policy's intent, it didn't discuss um, bridal ways in the policy. There were a couple of representations related to bridal ways. So uh, the campaign to protect rural England um, was a bit critical of the expansion of bridal ways, saying that it would harm uh, farms, whereas uh, the British Horse Society um, spoke uh, in favour of of the economic role that bridal ways can play. So yeah, it might be something to take forward um, when we write the policy. Uh, and then this is me as well, moving on to policy JAL, protecting the best agricultural land. So um, this policy relates to when and how development on agricultural land and soil should be considered. And again, there wasn't, um, compared to other policies in the batch, there weren't a lot of representations for this one. Um, some parish councils, government and political organisations expressed support for the policy. Um, some, again, uh, the campaign to protect rural England um, thought that the policy didn't go far enough in, in protecting agricultural land, whereas um, others, uh, I think the, the, the Cambridge and South Cambridgeshire Green parties, um, thought that policy, um, they, they were worried about the policy prioritising food production over habitat restoration. And one developer uh, questioned the need for the policy as they perceived it to be already included in um, national policy slash building regulations. Thanks, Kieran. So the next policy is JPB, protecting existing business space. And this policy states what existing business spaces will be protected and how businesses and employment land can be changed to other uses. So there were some individuals, developers, charities and parishes that were expressive in support of the policy. Um, others considered the policy to recognise the importance of flexibility to change of uses. Uh, the manufacturer DB Group Holdings wanted the policy to support the expansion of existing successful business spaces rather than just protecting them. Next slide, please. Thank you. So policy JRW, enabling remote working, sets out how proposals for remote working hubs and working at home should be considered. The policy direction proposes that policies will support the creation of local employment hubs and outlines acceptable types, scale and location of development. Uh, again, parish councils, developers, political organisations and University of Cambridge express support for the policy. A few respondents argued that the policy should uh, be strengthened to refer to the provision of home office space and new dwellings. 
Contrastingly, uh, Cambridge and South Cambridgeshire Green parties asked that extensions were tested for proof of a need of home working. I'll pass you now on to Charlotte. Thanks, Lizzie. So going on to policy JAW, Affordable Workspace and Creative Industries. Um, this policy proposes requirement for affordable workspace to be delivered as a proportion of larger commercial developments with affordable workspace defined as workspace that has rental value below the market rate, that generally being 80% of the market rate or less. Um, if on-site provision is not possible, the policy does propose to require financial contributions for equivalent off-site provision. And the policy proposes that major mixed use development should incorporate both an element of affordable workspace and should also include provision for creative artist workspace, rehearsal and performance space. There was some support um, to this policy from developers, parish councils, charities and landowners, but there was also um, feedback whereby some people wanted the cost to be set at the lower rate um, than the 80% to ensure they were actually affordable spaces and other questioned the requirements of the policy due to a perceived lack of evidence. There was a developer response also received wanting the requirements for affordable workspace to be formulated via an assessment of the commercial viability of the scheme. So moving on to the next slide, thank you. Um, which is JEP, supporting a range of facilities in employment parks, with this policy proposing to support appropriately scaled leisure, eating and social hub facilities, um, where they support the functioning of an employment area and where they're primarily aimed at meeting the needs of workers on site and to help manage transport impacts and developments. Um, we had general support for this policy, um, for the approach. Um, some respondents did receive a question sorry, requested additional facilities to be included in the policy, these being um, showering facilities, water refilling stations and green spaces. And there's one particular comment taken out which noted a perceived lack of facilities on the Cambridge Biomedical Campus. Thanks Charlotte. So the next policy is JRC, Retail and Centres. So this policy covers the treatment of retail and leisure including arts, culture and entertainment and other city centre proposals in Cambridge. Um, it includes district, local and neighbourhood centres, as well as the towns and villages of South Cambridgeshire and out of town development. So several respondents, including parish councils, expressed support for the policy and supported town centre and village shops specifically. A few respondents objected to the potential use of Article 4 directions, which restrict the conversion of shops to alternative uses. Contrastingly, Cambridge Past, Present and Future supported the use of Article 4 directions to remove permitted development rights. I'll hand you over to Bruce now. Thanks. Thank you. Um, next to policy JVA, Visitor Accommodation, Attractions and Facilities. So given the importance of tourism for greater Cambridge economy, uh, this policy is needed to explain where hotel and other uses of visitor accommodation development will be supported in Greater Cambridge and how the loss or gain of new hotels visitor accommodation will be managed. It also um, hopes to address the matter of um, people converting uh, where planning permission is needed, the conversion of residential properties to permanent visitor accommodation use within Cambridge uh, and elsewhere in South Cambridgeshire where it outlines the exceptional circumstances where it does not adversely affect um, the supply of afford or full of affordability even of local housing, including rental values, residents amenity and sense of security and the local area's character of community cohesion. In terms of responses, many respond respondents exp express support for the policy. Um, suggestions to improve the policy included recognising the potential role of retail centres in the city centre to deliver accommodation and a suggestion that new visitor accommodation should provide a contribution to mitigate their impact. Um, concerns were expressed over the loss of housing to short term accommodation, um, greater Cambridge's capacity to sustain increased visitor numbers and how the policy could potentially undermine the plans green infrastructure policies and gl greater clarity was requested regarding <coughs> when new attractions would be acceptable in rural areas. Uh, moving on to policy JFD, faculty development and specialist language schools. Um, so for background to this policy, the University of Cambridge and associated colleges are an important centre for teaching research as well as being a significant employer. ARU is also an important centre of learning. 
There are also several specialist colleges in Cambridge, which itself is an important centre for the study of English as a foreign language. Uh, for these reasons, it is important to support the growth of higher education institutions, language schools and specialist colleges while minimising the potential impact of their new development. Uh, the policy will state when new faculty, higher education development, teaching hospital facilities, specialist colleges and language schools will be supported and the requirements that will need to be satisfied. In terms of comments, a variety of different respondents expressed support for the policy although one responder objected to the policy on the grounds that hosting students provides funds for families who have a low income. Uh, one suggestion to improve the policy included making a distinction between privately operated and state funded education due to changes of use under the permitted development rights. Uh, ARU also suggested improvements to the policy to better reflect their strategic priorities. So um, I appreciate that's perhaps a bit of a brief whistle stop tour of the of, of, of the job section, um, but we now move to a discussion section where. Um, if you have any comments on particular areas. Um, OK, thanks very much for that, um, <laughs> Tim. Yes, um, just on the last on the last point about the specialist language and schools, I'm not sure I quite understood what the objection really was. Um, so the students, uh, hosting students, providing funds for families who have a low income. What's the problem with that? So, so the, the, I think it was a bit of confusion within the policy because we don't mind people having home shares where they stay with a family, but mm -hmm. I think they interpreted that we didn't, we, we don't want whole houses in the private sector being taken out of the private sector local rental market by language school students we would we don't mind them as part of a part of a specialist school language school growing if they could provide students in home um um homestays that is fine and i think they misunderstood our concern that we don't want students taking up houses in the private rental accommodation because that and that removes houses from the private rental market so I think it was more a bit of a confusion over what we meant by private housing. OK, so we need to clarify that then. Yes, yes. OK. OK. Um, so I am conscious that we have we, a lot of perhaps different specialist questions, so one officer might not be able to answer all the questions. So I'll be looking to John for a lead on some of the jobs because um, one of our officers who works in this area is uh, not uh, um, with us at the moment, so um, okay. I don't no, know how we fine. should do this. I, with, don't, with... I don't expect one person to know everything, <laughs> <laughs> especially when we've had you know the team of you actually making the presentation. So that's fine. All right. Thank you, Chair. Please take um, us through it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, I think the first hand that was up was uh, Councillor Thumbrow. Uh, thank you for the presentation. I got a few things. I was interested in the comment about is uh, early on about too restrictive on logistics based education facilities and high tech. And we I'm particularly keen that we try and understand what's happening with retail more and in line with our carbon um, climate target. So logistics based and last mile deliveries and sustainable transport is really is really important and um i don't know whether we we're allowing for things like um logistics sent larger logistics centers and then smaller one and last mile delivery and um also bus depots things like that that's one question another question is um we've got a lot of airbnb and very short term lets in cambridge where they we is out of control almost in some areas and can we somehow ensure that where we want homes provided that they remain homes or they have airbnb within what's legally permitted is that possible yeah it's just those two thank you So who's answering that? Should I start, Chair? We've got various experts, as, as Bruce alluded to, but on the logistics, uh, you may recall in our um, January um, meetings, 
and the economy evidence update. Um, we alluded again to logistics as one of the um, sectors that we're looking at in terms of exploring its needs. And the evidence um, did indicate that the need for logistics had gone up since we did the first evidence a couple of years ago. And you could you could look at reasons for that, and it could include um, changing shopping habits, habits as, as was discussed. Um, we certainly have already made provision for logistics um, in our first proposals. You recall an allocation um, on the edge of uh, near the A14 services, mm -hmm. and we also include a policy on. Um, uh, last mile as well, looking at how that 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 transfer of goods can be supported. But we did say in January as well, we needed to look again at how the plan would respond to the logistics issues, and that's still a task with us before we come back to you with the draft plan. Um, we are very much looking at retail. Bruce, do you want to pick that up? We are still doing our, our study to look at the draft plan, aren't we? Yes. Um... So we have been doing um, with my colleague Lizzie um, retail surveys uh, every year just to see how our current centres in Cambridge are working. Uh, we've also rolled that out to uh, some of the larger rural centres uh, in South Cambridge here just to check just how, how, how much, what, what percentage are vacant and of those which aren't vacant, uh, just how Kind of what what's 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 now in them because we've now got class use e which allows things to happen without us necessarily knowing about it so um and um correct me if i'm wrong lizzie but you know the sensors are looking right healthy in terms of low vacancy rates i think what's happened is the landlords have had to reduce their rents and so that has now attracted people where they are opportunities which they probably wouldn't have had perhaps 10 years ago i mean in, in cambridge city center um even even streets like on green streets off uh off city street have now got a lot lower vacancy rates than they were about 12 months ago um uh, and i mean i don't know i mean we all shop um but we haven't stopped shopping for food and um and uh, i think people do like to try on things before they actually um buy something so i think some of our shops are now becoming more like warehouses and they don't want you to buy in the shop because that means they've got to have a lot of stock it's much easier for you to choose it online choose it make sure you it fits in or like it when you jump on the mattress go online to buy it and that and that still saves all the logistics so um we've had well I know our consultants tells that our, that there has been a recent um, update from COVID in terms of how things are. Um, we've not actually, that's actually only come out a couple of weeks ago. So one of my action points is to pick up with our retailers, to find, uh, with our consultants to see how things are. Um, but I don't think it's as bad as um, perhaps, or well, we're lucky, I think where we are, we have a vibrant uh, economy and our vacancy rates are generally lower. Um, so, I'm not saying we're out of the woods yet, but I think it is um, people are coming back to the city centres and there's not so many vacancy rates in the in, in, the, in our centres. Okay. And then on the um, just to finish off on the Airbnb point, um, we did cover this again in the first proposals and clearly, you know, a lot of um, this type of use doesn't require planning permission, but where it does, um, we did set out the circumstances where uh where proposals needed planning permission uh the impact on amenity parking so on a perfectly you know possible being considered um through that process bruce is anything i think one on? thing as when we update our evidence base one of the key aspects is to actually um consult with the large employers um in cambridge because often they generates a demand for they recruit people and offer them three months accommodation as part of the deal to move to Cambridge. So I think the idea is, is that we um, consult with them to see whether the new apart hotels, of which there are quite a few now under construction in the city, how they will help take pressure off them to go through the more um, um, informal Airbnb routes. I also I need to 
check with development management, but I think on new developments, it is perhaps easier to provide covenants or restrictions which prevent the use to residential. However, there is the matter of compliance. Um, that I think is often how do you actually prove there's been a material change? And um, that is still kind of a debate, which I think is, you know, finding that balance. Um, but uh, I I like to think we are able to try and make it less difficult on new builds where we can perhaps introduce some sort of restrictions where it becomes something that can be enforced. Um, yeah. OK, uh, just a, a point that's just occurred to me on that one, because one of the things um, that uh, came up under J policy JRW was homework in space and the re request to have something for you know working from home so hopefully what you've just said doesn't contract you know the policies don't contradict themselves um, i'd like to think none of our policies <laughs> will contradict them and we will obviously need to do a bit of a test where we get need to writing them to make sure that we're not somehow making another policy um but uh, yeah it's um i mean uh yeah, I'll have to. Yeah, it's just I, I just thought I'd raise yeah, that. Yeah, yes. Well, we so we we we'll, we'll... we don't fall into that uh, into that trap. Okay. Thank you. Okay. The next question. Uh, I think the next person was Councillor. Oh gosh, now I've lost the um. Was it Peter Sanford? I think it was me. Yes. Thank you, Chair. Yes. <laughs> um. I was also going to raise the matter of logistics space. Um, I think John's covered a lot of my um, queries, but my perception is that Greater Cambridge is surrounded by huge logistics sheds in Bedford, Peterborough, Beaver Hill and others. Um, but I am conscious that my delivery vans, DPD come from somewhere in Northamptonshire with a, a transit van. Um, Amazon come from Milton Keynes, so it's not so much the last mile we need to need to think about. It's the last maybe five, ten miles, the the medium sized logistics distribution. And I'm also wondering, um, do we need to think about Amazon and their um, drone parcel deliveries, which I know they're piloting in Cambridge, <laughs> somewhat tongue in cheek, but. You know, 10 years time and in the life of this policy, there may be drones over our heads. Mm, interesting. Over to you, Jonathan. <laughs> well, no, I think that's it's, it's an interesting point. And certainly um, if you look back at plans, uh, development plans for this area going back, say, 20 years, um, the strong focus of those plans was to restrict um, warehousing to only being the smallest Correct. Um, mm. spaces, but um, I guess the lifestyles have changed. And mm. when the evidence we reported in January highlighted the perhaps low level of provision compared with many comparable cities. So our job in the local plan perhaps is to how to balance that issue, because there is a sustainability angle to meeting the needs of Cambridge locally but perhaps that balance is not trying to compete with areas which are um as you say the surrounding areas which also focus on that yeah. so that's the, the challenge we've got to find the right path through indeed i will just add as well john that um in the next infrastructure chapter we've got policy on freight and delivery consolidation and infrastructure and delivery so we'll go into a bit more detail with the reps on those okay thanks lizzie OK, um, Councillor Tim Bick. Thank you. Uh, I have um, I have five questions, I'm sorry, um, but I'll, oh, upload yeah. the, I'll unload them all at once. They're diverse. Um, so the, the first one in, in the introductory uh, general section on jobs, um, the collection of, uh, of representations seem to include the emergence of this debate about um, um, the, the proportion of high tech versus non high tech employment. And um, I, I then went back to look at what we were actually saying, and I couldn't really find any sort of 
any basis for the comments? And I, I wondered if you could um, help help point that out. And um, are we saying anywhere apart from the fact that um, that, that we don't want to see warehousing and distribution national or regional? Are we are we expressing any sort of sort of steer? in the direction of um, um, high tech life sciences? That's the first question. Um, the second one um, was um, a, a smaller one about remote working. Um, so there were some points raised there about um, whether what we're what we're suggesting here should lead to something that we say also about new build. And I wonder what officers thinking is about whether that does or should go anywhere, um, whether whether we we're, we're looking for some provision within new build that um, enables home working. Um, the third one uh, is about the affordable workspace um, policy, uh, which I you know I find really um, a, a very alluring um, policy, um, but I'm still a bit confused about about how this can be delivered as a policy because you know when we're talking about affordable housing we're looking to sort of um registered social landlords to, uh -huh. to deliver that and i don't see the comparable kind of institutional framework for affordable uh, workspace um I, I also um wonder about the criteria we, we all are comfortable looking for housing at the sets of criteria that have been transparent and publicly approved. And I wonder where that's that would come from, if anywhere. And then the other question is about change over time, because perhaps more than you know, even more than people, um, businesses can start off maybe satisfying criteria for affordable workspace, but you know, some of them grow and can get much more successful. And one wouldn't really want them to necessarily hog limited yeah, affordable yeah. workspace um, when the, they, we could be letting new new businesses move in. Um, so I just wonder what, what the thinking was uh, behind that. Um, the next one was about retail and centres. And I'm just really wondering um, what what controls we really have about this in um, uh, anymore, given the, the, the use class E and uh, and I, I'm, I'm feeling that a lot of members want to have more influence than this new use class gives us. And I, I, I really believe that we we should be in, informed, perhaps by um, some paper from officers about what our tools are, what what we are left with to influence this this area. Because um, again, it's not obvious to me. And the fifth and final question was about uh, visitor accommodation and. I um, just bit building on what Katie Thornborough said earlier. Um, I, you know, I think this is a really serious one. We've we put we pushed the boat out, um, or we're trying to push the boat out in a number of policy areas, based on Cambridge maybe being a little bit extreme or a little bit different from the average place around the UK. Um, and I believe this is this ought to be one of them, uh, because the centre of Cambridge. Uh, it, it, it is absolutely facing, as Katie says, uncontrolled conversion of housing into um, uh, short term visitor accommodation. Uh, and I do think that our policy levers are not obvious again. Um, they tend to be very reactive. We wait till someone converts a building and then we try and do something about it um, for reasons that I understand. But I'm wondering whether we should. Um, be making the case for some for, for for some policy which maybe lies a little bit outside the regular national framework. Those are my five questions, Jan. <laughs> wow. Okay. Well, that's quite uh, quite wide ranging, um, but I suspect uh, yes. I'll hand over to Jonathan. But I think one of the things that um, came to my mind when you mentioned the last question, uh, Councillor Big, was potential for Article Four to be used. Um, but that's just my view. Perhaps John can say something to it. Uh, really good points. And part of my response will be these are exactly the sort of issues we'll need to look at through the draft plan. Um, in terms of the point about the general reps, and I guess the focus on making provision for high tech and other sectors. Um, 
again, looking back at our previous employment evidence in the January reports, what we've done is try to explore the needs of all sectors and identify uh, what provision would be needed to support them. So that's not only high tech, but also those other sectors, including industry and including logistics. So the aim certainly has been to respond to that needs evidence by looking to make appropriate provision through the local plan. Um, as we are you know, required to do by the MPPF, which asks us to look at what the needs are and, and seek to respond to them unless, you know, unless we are unable to do so for, for clear reasons. I'm paraphrasing, but that's probably what it says. Um, in terms of the remote working, um, I think part of the answer there is that um, for new builds, certainly um, our policy would seek the proposals to implement the national space standards. So that's really the mechanism of making sure that the new homes have the right sizes and are fit for purpose. And the remote working policy is more about helping homes to adapt. So it's the, it's the um, new new homes size standard really is the mechanism offered to us when controlling those sizes, of room sizes and so on uh, going forward on new homes. I think your points on affordable workspace are, are are very well made. I think when we put the proposal forward um, in the first proposals, um, it was clear we still needed to work up the detail of the criteria and we're very much still looking to do that. The policy has been implemented previously, so we looked at what's been done in London and there are examples of space being um, brought forward. Um, I think it is possible to come up with appropriate criteria and appropriate percentages. I think there are Developers, I think, from the representation, so I recall, there are those that potentially be willing to support that. So I think it's certainly worth um, our continued development of that policy, but I don't deny those are issues we need to work up in detail to bring to you. Okay. Um, the retail, um, yes, again, I would agree. Class E has made those controls on change of use and so on more difficult, certainly significantly less than they were when the previous plans uh, were adopted um, and the new local plan will have to reflect what controls we have and what we don't. Uh, Article 4 was referenced in the consultation as one tool that is available, um, but um, there is quite a high bar in seeking to um, deliver those that we need to overcome as they're not straightforward to apply. So it's something we could continue to explore, but you need very strong evidence about a very particular situation. I could go into more detail, but they are not straightforward to, to deliver. Um, on the visitor accommodation, again, yeah, good policy challenges. I think they're, they're very much issues we'd look to um, explore uh, as we develop the policy. So it's one where when we come back to you with draft policies, you can see if it meets uh, the overall requirements which we set out to achieve. Uh, in the first proposals document, but yes, certainly something we highlighted as being a concern in the document will be looking to develop appropriate policy. Mm. But um, Jonathan, if I can take you up on that, um, you do, there is evidence presumably of the sort of numbers of houses that have been converted to Airbnbs in the city. Uh, yeah, I think that's something we do have evidence of and we're working with our DM colleagues to look at that. Certainly that evidence would then help us in demonstrating the need for a policy approach. So we'll be looking to look, see what we can gather up. Yeah, OK. All right, thank you for that. Uh, I think the next uh, is Rich, uh, Councillor Williams. All right, I'm just keeping an thank eye on the time and we're nearly at the hour point. So if we can be quick so that we can go to infrastructure and then we've got the time to discuss that. All right. Yeah. Thanks, Councillor Williams. Thank you, Jared. Quick one, because most of my other questions have already been asked. Um, just a comment that jumped out at me. I'd be interested in officer's reaction to it's comment 58021 and the, the feedback we got from, from the Imperial War Museum. Concerns that the draft policies don't provide supportive um, or don't promote the, the growth of um, clusters as required by the NPPF, paragraphs 81 and 83. Just be interested in officer's response to that comment that was received. Clusters off. It just says the, it says the draft policies do not support have have insufficient uh, support for technological clusters. Oh, I 
I see. Okay. So just interested what, what officer's response to that is, because I, I, I think what's behind my question is I think that's probably an argument that might be coming down the road at us. So I'd be interested in the response. Over to you, Jonathan. Oh, so my, my recollection of this particular comment was it was linked to um, a call for site proposal about um, AvTech, so an aviation related sector. And I think there's been some um, planning application activity since then on the Duxford site, or I could be recalling wrong. Um, so um, I think that the question is whether the, the plan itself does enough to support new clusters. Mm. And I think the argument would be um, that we do try and provide a supportive um, planning framework for clusters. Uh, in the policies within this chapter, for example, appropriate supporting new employment about where the policy says it would be appropriate, but also making um, land and floor space provision in some of our new developments, for example. Now they aim to provide a flexible um, floor space uh, provision to make sure we do support support our clusters. So uh, I think I would challenge that that point and consider that we have made um, a response um, as to whether are there site specific points. Um, the first proposals didn't include um, the uh, proposals that I think they put forward in the call for sites, but I think the reasons were provided for that in the evidence base. Are you happy with that, Councillor Williams? Thank you. Right, I've got two more, um, Councillor Smart and Councillor Simon Smith. So Councillor Smart, please. Martin Smart. Yeah, I put my hand up uh, earlier on. It was just about that thing to do with the um, Airbnb and stuff in Cambridge. Well, in, in South Camps as well. But I mean, I think we need to um, think about our interest in that, don't we, as well, because we're developing an a, um, Airbnb type hotel. So um, obviously, if we're it sounded like we were trying to encourage um, people to use those sorts of facilities that we are investing in rather than using the sort of general market, which obviously would be an interest. <laughs> OK, um, any comments, Jonathan, on that one? No, you're on mute. <laughs> Sorry, Court. Um, I think, uh, you know, as planning officers, my response response and my colleagues' responses are, are neutral to that. We're, we're trying to respond to the land use issues. So I don't think that's something we're taking into account in you know, making our responses. OK. <laughs> but what, what we don't want to do is um, make policies that we fall foul of ourselves. Yeah, of course. Yeah. yeah. OK. Uh, thank you. Uh, Councillor Simon Smith, please. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, it seems to me there are four different forms of land use requirements, uh, employment land use requirements in the subregion. Um, the first one relates to provision for last mile deliveries. And there's been some redevelopment at Bar Hill. It seems to me that that would be the most ideal location for last mile deliveries. And then within the tech sector, there are various sub markets. Uh, so there's obviously the high tech office based. There's the hybrid which mixes offices and manufacturing. There's the wet labs and they um, all will require um, development plateaus for zero carbon development because they're international um, corporates and they need to have zero carbon development as part of their corporate social responsibility commitments. So that's that set. The other group are those companies which are involved in business to business and business to consumer, and they're typically in small light industrial states. And these estates are under enormous development pressure, but I don't see that we've made alternative provision for those um, light industrial unit markets. And the problem is, if there's an employment, employment land user allocation, um, then 
it gets taken up by the tech sector because they can outbid um, the businesses who only want, want small light industrial units. And I see that as a, a, a problem which is going to occur during the um, during the, the, the plan period. Um, and then the last one relates to bus depots. Um, because if we are to have uh, a high quality bus system, we will need more buses and we will need places for them to be laid over and so main, maintained and so on and so forth. Yeah. And the biggest depot is in northeast Cambridge. And the proposition is to um, redevelop that. And so we need to think about that seriously. And the obvious place location for them is to have perhaps a small service centre in the city, um, possibly in northeast Cambridge, with satellite layover spaces at the park and ride sites. But that means that requires the cooperation of the county council, and it probably means development in the green belt. So we've got a complex mix of land use planning problems to address. Challenges, I would like to call them. Challenges. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Smith. <laughs> um, okay, Jonathan, Bruce. Uh, they're all, yes, definitely challenges we've got to look at. Just on the um, industrial estates, um, clearly, again, as far as we are able, um, the current Cambridge Local Plan seeks to protect not just employment land, but specifically identifies a number of um, industrial estate type uses in the city. So clearly there's an opportunity there to review and update that policy. And it will be about looking for that type of space and not just mm -hmm. the high tech space. So thinking about some of the new communities identified um, in the first proposals, mm -hmm. um, they all identify um, the idea of planning for a mix of uses. Uh, not just North East Cambridge. So there are other opportunities to look for new spaces um, like that as well. So it will be about how we curate these spaces to meet our various needs. But I think, as was said, it is a challenge, but certainly one we'll be looking to face up to. OK. OK. Um, Councillor Thumber, I noticed you put your hand yeah. up again. Can, you be Can I just come back that, briefly please? on one thing? The, the remote working, I think this Remote working should also be for uh, children, uh, school and university students and also um, education for older people. And I think it should be not just in homes, but in facilities nearby community uh, halls or spaces um, where you can hire a room with more equipment if you want to do a special presentation or get people together, for example, at the Clay Farm Community Centre. So it's not just in homes, but nearby. Thanks. OK, thank you for that. Um, Jonathan, you'll take a note of that. OK, thank you. Um, we, oh, Councillor Shayla, that was very late. Sorry, uh, just a very quick comment. There's also remote diagnosis at home as well. And while we're trying to uh, provide more things within 15 minutes of a home, and there was a mention of drones before, just, just to mention, we have Starship robots already in the area, already functioning, and I'm sure that wasn't on the agenda 10 years ago. So. Are those the ones with the um, things that you have? The yeah, on the, yeah, the, yeah the, those ones. Yeah. Cute little ones, yeah. <laughs> Thank you for uh, mentioning those. OK. Um, I guess the next the next item is on the infrastructure section. Am I right? Over to you then, team. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. I hope you can hear me. It's Matt Patterson here. Um, I'm, my computer's lagging significantly, so you will come across distorted on my screen, but hopefully you can see and hear me. Um, yes, I'm just waiting Thank for you. Kieran's presentation to come up. I'm introducing to you tonight the series of proposed infrastructure policies that collectively seek to ensure that alongside the spatial framework, the planned homes and jobs are supported by sustainable travel options and will have sufficient water and energy supply. 
and will have access to community services and facilities required to support the health and well-being of both existing and new communities. Um, the policies are concerned also with ensuring that the infrastructure that we secure uh, can be provided at the right time and in the right place, as well as ensuring that um, we can manage the complexities of how infrastructure is, is delivered, both on large sites, but in Cambridge also we have many different bodies responsible for delivering different elements of infrastructure that are required to then be coordinated and come together to provide a sustainable community as a whole. So the policies themselves need to address those issues. And as such, the policies um, cut across many of the main planning themes throughout the emerging Greater Cambridge Local Plan, including the strategic objectives around connectivity, inclusiveness, climate change and placemaking. Um, not surprisingly, the vast majority of respondents uh, expressed significant support for the policies and the overarching aims within those. Um, there are suggested improvements, primarily associated with um, ensuring we maximise the benefit of whatever infrastructure we put in place, given the level of investment required for these. Um, and we also ensure that, uh, that that infrastructure that we put in is not at the expense of of uh, damaging the environment. Um, and obviously a, group, a great influence was put on health and transport infrastructure, which are two key uh, infrastructure requirements. Uh, a few residents criticised that I think primarily uh, there was a focus that we're not doing enough regarding reinforcement of the energy network grid and ensuring um, that, that we will have sufficient capacity within the energy network. Um, to accommodate growth uh, well beyond the plan period as well. Um, a couple of respondents argued that that uh, they they think that the infrastructure should be operational and up and running before the new development comes into into um, operation or occupation. Um, that's quite difficult, especially if you're trying to get developers to fund that infrastructure. They sort of need to either rent floor space or occupy housing or sell housing uh, to then raise the capital to provide the bulk of the infrastructure. But certainly some infrastructure does need to be um, put in place early. And it's about how you phase and manage that infrastructure delivery to ensure that the community health and well-being is maintained throughout. Um, and there was a slight criticism or as well that there needs to be more joined up thinking between national infrastructure projects and more local infrastructure projects. Right, uh, next slide. So the first policy that we have is around uh, sustainable transport and connectivity. And already we've discussed at length the need for managing uh, transport. <coughs> And in particular, the need to ensure that the transport responds um, uh, adequately to mitigate the impacts of new development on the transport networks. Uh, overall, the, the policy itself uh, seeks to do that uh, primarily through locating development, either where it minimises the need to travel, so locating next to or to uh, good amenities as well as jobs, or uh, where there's already effective sustainable transport provision, so locating them at transport hubs or where we have connectivity already, or where we are proposing to improve um, sustainable transport connectivity. And all of those are aimed at reducing our reliance upon private cars. We know that that's a significant contributor to climate change, um, but that also includes, uh, as we've just recently talked about and discussed servicing requirements and how we ensure that new homes and new employment floor space can be adequately serviced in a most efficient manner um, that reduces uh, the impacts of servicing requirements as well. Um, and overall, we need to be mindful as well throughout the policies around how uh, infrastructure is changing. As uh, we're already aware, uh, drones and robots uh, delivering your goods was probably something unthought of until we looked at S Star Trek movies years ago. So I'm going to pass over now to one of my colleagues to deal with parking.
Kieran. Ah, uh, yeah, that's me. Yeah, thanks very much, Matt. Um, so yeah, so this this policy sets out requirements for uh, cycle and vehicle parking, including uh, infrastructure for electrical, uh, sorry, electric vehicle parking. Um, it proposes to set minimum standards. And also another key requirement from the policy is that it will ask developers to uh, submit evidence of a management strategy for any uh, communal charging points. So you had a qu quite a few representations of this policy, um, variety of organisations, parish councils, la landowners, developers uh, expressed support for the policy, but there were uh, suggestions to improve it. Uh, so some, some of the representations wanted more information about what the required parking standards would actually be. Uh, I think a couple of landowners uh, slash developers wanted a bit more flexibility uh, relating to site specific circumstances. So in relation to what that quantum of parking standards would be. And then there's also um, a comment relating to aesthetics and, and wanting um, this policy to ensure that it minimises visual clutter. Uh, and then there, there are crit criticisms of policy. So the Home Builders Federation um, perceived the policy to already be, well, that it should be covered by building regulations, national building regulations. Um, there are a couple of comments um, that wanted the policy to prioritise sustain sustainability over parking. So, you know, quite anti um, car parking generally. And related to Matt's earlier slide, uh, there are a couple of comments about ensuring the electric grid is upgraded to actually deliver the policy's intent. Uh, so this is me as, again. So um, yeah, I, IFD freight and delivery con consolidation. So it sets out how development of um, delivery hubs should be constituted and how development proposals should provide space for uh, servicing, storage and deliveries. And um, the overall policy intent is to uh, seek opportunities to reduce the number of freight and servicing vehicles and their environmental impact um, whilst promoting more sustainable forms of transport. So yeah, there are quite a few comments expressing support for the policy. Um, the yeah, the environment environment agency posted quite a wide ranging uh, representation where they wanted um, safeguarding to to include uh, what is required for water infrastructure, green infrastructure, and, and Oh, sorry, I'm reading the wrong one. <laughs> uh, sorry, smart, smart, uh, smart Cambridge Transport. Um, they posted a very substantial representation where they um, wanted the local plan to ident want identify specific logistics hub, and they also included possible uh, suggestion, uh, suggestions where it could be located. Um, a few respondents argued that the policy needed to support changes to enable car cargo bikes to deliver goods. Um, yeah, quite a few comments related to cargo bikes. And then there was also quite a few uh, landowners and uh, developers who criticised the scope of the policy and also said that well, their sites could uh, deliver the policy's in intent as well. Um, so now passing on to the actual <laughs> safeguarding important uh, infrastructure the next policy. Thanks, Kieran. So yeah, safeguarding important infrastructure, uh, the policy sets out what infrastructure should be safeguarded from the impacts of development and how they should be assessed namely proposing to continue the safeguarding of Lord's Bridge radio telescope and existing rail freight facilities and sidings at Duxford, Foxton, Fulbourne and Whittlesford. So there was a variety of organisations expressing support for the policy's direction. The Environment Agency, as Kieran mentioned before, noted that they would uh, expect safeguarding to continue and include uh, requirements for water infrastructure, green infrastructure and biodiversity. Uh, the University of Cambridge, Anglian Water and Defence Infrastructure provided lengthy representations and explained why their infrastructure needed to continue or be safeguarded. Next slide, thank you. Oh, yeah, cool, that was a bit slow. Uh, policy IAD is on aviation development and this policy seeks to control development proposals related to aviation and sets out in what circumstances and how development should take into account aviation safety. So there was some criticism of the policy with the county questioning implications that aviation would not have a significant adverse impact on the environment. One individual argued that the plan does not do enough to protect airfields, so there's a bit of a contrast there. It was also requested that the policy aligned with proposals from the Civil Aviation Authority regarding safeguarding zones. Hand you over to Matt. Thank you.
hopefully you can all hear me. I think Emma, are you dealing with this one? Are you online? Certainly can do, yeah. Um, so yeah, this is uh, policy IEI. So this is energy infrastructure master planning. Um, so this policy was effectively looking to uh, require uh, or include requirements for energy infrastructure to support development and included a requirement for energy master plans for certain scales of development. So there were quite a lot of comments expressing support from the policy. There were a few suggestions as well as to how the policy wording could be improved. So Carbon Neutral Cambridge uh, suggested uh, wording in the policy to require developers to contribute to the costs of improving the power grid, which is something that does happen. Um, there was also an argument that smart localised energy systems should be the new norm, um, no matter the size of new developments. We did also have a few objections to the emerging policy as well. So Persimmon um, argued that the outcomes of an energy master plan needed to be considered within any viability assessment um, and Metro Property Unit Trust wanted to see a specific threshold within the policy for non-residential floor space. All right, the next one's back to me, which is uh, policy uh, IID, which is about infrastructure and delivery. So pretty much all new development creates additional demand for infrastructure and services, and it's reasonable for developers to address that need in order to, to ensure that their development proposal is considered sustainable in planning terms. So the policy in itself sets out how we will ensure that new development will contribute to the delivery of needed uh, and essential infrastructure. And this includes delivery by the developers themselves on site uh, and as well securing contributions towards either local um, offsite provision as well as towards strategic infrastructure that serves uh, a greater proportion of the population as well. Um, most of the respondents expressed uh, support for the policy. There were specific issues raised, uh, in, in particular around health and education provision, um, and ensuring that uh, we did more uh, in terms of cross-boundary working on those matters, in particular uh, with neighbouring local authorities um, outside of South Cambridgeshire. Um, and then the Wildlife Trust as well uh, wanted a greater emphasis placed on the funding of strategic natural green spaces and green infrastructure. Um, comments highlighted the importance of securing uh, developer funding and, and applying effective thresholds to when we'll require those and specific requirements within the policy to ensure that the triggers are robust for those. Okay, so it's on to me for the last point of this section, um, policy IDI digital infrastructure. Um, digital infrastructure obviously being a significant part of everyone's contemporary living, goes across a lot of things. Um, but this policy in particular sets out how development should contribute to Greater Cambridge's requirement for broadband, mobile phone and smart infrastructure. Um, the policy does intend to set requirements for applicants to submit a connectivity statement with a planning application to demonstrate how their proposal um, would meet the requirements in the policy. Um, so you'll see this, there was general support for, uh, for the policy from Paris councils, political organisations and landowners, but there were criticisms received to this policy, um, including that the requirements should not exceed building regulations, um, that the policy wording was too loose and needs re refining, um, and that there was a perception received that the policy did not go far enough in requiring high speed connectivity. Um, there was also um, requests from developers around the clarity of whether all development would be uh, required to submit the connectivity statement um, in the policy. So now we will move on to the next slide and discussion. Right. Thank you very much, uh, team. Um, certainly a lot to go through there. Um, I do have a few questions, but I will. Um, just mention one thing regarding the payment um, or the requirement for developers to, you know, provide uh, funding for things like improving the grade as, as you know as well as everything else that 
we ask them to provide for. I think my concern here is that uh, the government, as part of its um, uh, planning policy upgrade, is looking at the new infrastructure levy, um, which, if mem memory serves me right, uh, is they're intending to make that payable prior to first occupation or something along those lines, which means local authorities will be required to find some way of funding that, which in my view is putting the horse before the car, really. Uh, should we go, <laughs> I don't see how we can do that. I mean, what's, what's your view on that? I don't know when, if they'll come up with something, but obviously we need to be sure that in trying to in trying to make sure that the, uh, the developments are actually delivered, we can't be asking them to make too, you know, to spend too much because it comes back to affordable housing will be the one that takes the hit. Yeah, so if I can answer that, um, essentially it's coming out of the leveling up bill that's still going through parliament at the moment, which is the proposal to effectively scrap both the community infrastructure levy and section 106 regime yeah. and replace that with a single development tariff, if you like, so a development levy. And that yeah. development levy would cover all obligations that fall onto developers, so all policy obligations, including affordable housing, and would uh, effectively be a lump sum of money that then the local authority would need to determine whether they wanted to take part of that as affordable housing on site, uh, what proportion they would want to take towards strategic transport and all the other elements that fall out of a development to typically pay for. Uh, there's lots of issues with applying a tariff of that nature, um, not least um, many developments give rise to very localised specific impacts that need mitigation and it's currently unclear whether those fall within the a, a nationalized tariff if you like system mm -hmm. or not um, and even when you have a, a, a levy system such as that proposed as you say the timing of when that levy is paid will be key i think one of the things the government is looking at is whether local authorities have the appetite to borrow on um, potential future receipts, if you like, to forward fund infrastructure, which I can't see in the current climate any local authority having the appetite to take on those sorts of liabilities. The only saving grace we have is that uh, when they introduced the community infrastructure levy, it took years and years to implement. And then about several years after that to try and get it to work appropriately and effectively. So there will be a long transition phase before they can bring in, in any new um, sort of uh, planning obligations regime, if you like, um, to replace the existing two regimes. And hopefully that won't uh, come in, in at any time before we get the greater local plan through the planning process. Fingers, fingers, fingers crossed. Fingers crossed. I think fingers <laughs> crossed by everyone. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thanks for that. The other thing I wanted to talk about was the cargo bikes being allowed to deliver goods. That is something that's already happening in London, actually. Because um, I do know somebody who is involved with a company that does that. So, um, yes, you know, it's a good observation and hopefully something that we can, um, uh, you know, we can make allowances for in the policy. Okay, uh, Councillor Thumbra, I see your hands up. Yeah, uh, thank you very much. Uh, one of the, um, I, well, I find it difficult, the whole thing about the local plan fitting in with sustainable transport, I find is, is, is frustrating and <laughs> it's a bit of a mire, quagmire about how we affect sustainable transport plans and how they affect us and do we take priority or do they take priority or if they bring a you know if bus depots go in a certain location should we be thinking about the you know the how that would affect or provide opportunities going forward so that that's a, I, I'm still getting my head around that but I just wanted to make that point and then but one thing we don't seem to talk about um, is about trains that much and one of the things I learned earlier today was about the freight 
um, capacity at Felixstowe, and by I think we we were taught possibly by 2040 they could double the amount of freight coming into the country, and currently 25% of that goes on the trains. If it if we don't improve the capacity on the trains, we could have something like seven and a half thousand HGVs on the A14 a day going past you know past Cambridge. Uh, affecting the poorest part of Cambridge and the pollution, the effect on the roads is just appalling. And I think we need to have, we need to try and, the trains seem to be, for me, the, 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 the most reliable, fundamental things to get right in a transport system. And then off that, we, we hang the other, um, the possibilities about bus improvements and public transport and everything like that. So I don't know what influence we have on the trains, but it just seems like an incredibly important thing that's really going to affect this area um, so much. Thanks. Um, I don't know if Jonathan wants to come in, but I will start us off. Uh, yeah, it is a bit of chicken and egg. I think it's um, you you're in some ways reliant on significant government funding for new strategic transport infrastructure. Um, and it all depends on where you can put those routes in and therefore then maximising the benefits of having those sustainable new connections by locating development as close as possible to, to those uh, new, new railways, new connections, busways or whatever else they are. Um, and often at other times it's, it's still within our gift to say where along those transport uh, corridors is the most sustainable locations based on an assessment of uh, a wide range of, of factors in Greenbelt and, and um, community and impact on uh, surrounding neighbourhoods as well as uh, infrastructure beyond just sustainable transport, which is always a consideration. So, um, and just on the other, I think there is an opportunity with uh, East West Rail to look at new railheads, of course. Um, we have a number of safeguarded railheads, but they're probably at capacity. So it's probably a, a good time to look at uh, what provision for new safeguarded railheads we can make to uh, address the freight capacity demands moving forward. Obviously, we're, the other thing worth saying is we're not the transport authority, which I know members are aware. So it's it's a matter also for the local transport plan to explore these issues. And as Matt said, our local plan certainly almost seeks to react to those transport opportunities. You know, north northeast Cambridge, um, the biomedical campus, you know, even Camborne, they're prime examples of our plan seeking to react to those opportunities. So. Yeah. OK, uh, thank you for that. Um, right, next is Councillor Sanford. Thank you, Chair. Uh, there was a comment in one of the slides of questioning, I think, the adequacy of the park and ride sites. From memory, I think we've got three either new sites or relocated sites. Um, I'm not sure who the authority on sizing park and ride sites is, but are we confident that they'll cope with the uh, increased usage over the uh, the next 20 years, particularly when the dreaded congestion charge starts di displacing people towards the park and rides. Over to you, Jonathan. I, I think that's <laughs> one where we'd have to very much defer. So clearly Greater Cambridge Partnership is looking at what the park and ride needs and bringing those sites forward. And also the combined authority as our local transport authority developing its local transport plan has that has that important responsibility for buses as well. But certainly uh, from the local planning authority perspective and our local plan, certainly we look to make sure we work very closely with these organisations. So they're very clearly aware of our uh, emerging development plans and sites so we can um, look at how we plan transport in parallel uh, with development to make sure needs are properly met. Thank you. Yeah, I think I've just seen that it was policy I struck ST. Um, and in there also there was criticisms that, well, I guess perception that the national and local infrastructure aims are not joined up. <laughs> How can we join them up? I 
I guess it's by engaging with our partners through our duty to cooperate, which we, we endeavour to do to show we've done a good job in talking with all our partners and neighbours, so we'll keep trying to do that. Okay, um, next is, I think, go with me, Councillor Timbic. Thank you. Um, I wonder, um, I have two questions here. Um, the first is about the sustainable transport and connectivity uh, policy. Um, and I, I want to know, there's a lot of, a um, lot more interest in, um, for example, the extension of 20 mile an hour limits in residential areas. Uh, I, I guess if we knew that that was going to be applying to uh, a new development, then we would want to have uh, be able to require the uh, the roadways built with things like traffic calming in order to make that uh, effective. Uh, and is this policy the place where that sort of trigger needs to be, or or where would that need to be? Uh, and then the second question is on the policy about parking and electric vehicles. And it's the same sort of question, really. Um, the, um, the prior to adoption, it seems that a lot of um, uh, parking enforcement that gets uh, installed in new, new developments is private and very ineffective and very unaccountable. And uh, I wonder whether... Um, there is something that can be said here about um, the policy for the management of parking enforcement. Yeah, uh, so if I deal with the first one, uh, yeah, the policy itself is concerned, I think, with ensuring that we deliver sort of low traffic neighbourhoods. So in that context, it does give a, a very um, strong indication of our preference for traffic calming measures and other things to deliver on that aspiration and whether that includes a 20 mile an hour uh, max zones uh, i think is is a given as well on the parking enforcement i think we may struggle primarily because it will be seen as a matter that's slightly outside planning um, but we Again, it's something we can investigate and look at further. Just on the on the on the speed zones, the other things we're doing is um, working with the uh, county council who are developing an active travel toolkit. So to provide um, clearer guidance on how to support active travel, but I'm sure that would address the nature of um, routes within a site. The other opportunities we have, just thinking more widely, is um, the encouragement in national guidance for um, uh, design guides and toolkits and so on. Um, so there's probably opportunities again to look through our future design guidance at those issues as well uh, in greater detail. So I guess the question is how much you deal with at a policy level or whether you then look at it more in your design level, but that's certainly something we need to think about. OK, uh, thank you for that. Um, I, I'll come back to some of the uh, questions um, that came up as we were going through the um, presentation. Um, still on the electric parking or electric vehicle and um, parking, there was uh, one of the criticisms uh, was that the policy's intention would be covered by building regulations. Um, surely building regulations, if we are looking to be um, I guess more advanced and you know get ahead we can't we can't rely on just building regulations can we I mean similar to say we wanted 80 liters per person per day <laughs> for water usage and building regs is saying what 110 but then you know we're trying to be leaders in this and looking ahead to 2041 so what's your thoughts on that do you want to pick this one up Emma I, I think the answer is that the building regs only go so far so yeah, that's that's my understanding from having discussions with colleagues in environmental health who are obviously quite interested in electric vehicle charging. And my understanding was their concerns were that building regulations didn't go far enough and that there were too many circumstances in which you may not actually get electric vehicle charge points as well in certain situations 
I think there was some concerns around where you have areas of off plot parking, um, mm -hmm. not having pr sufficient provision within non residential parking as well. So I think, as with many things with building regulations, it kind of sets a minimum requirement, but there is a feeling that in a lot of areas where it is viable to do so, it is better to go beyond that uh, and make sure that we are getting more in the way of electric vehicle charge points and water efficiency and many other areas. <laughs> indeed, indeed, indeed. And one of the other things that I'm not sure, I think it was part of this discussion um, about the management of common charging spaces. Just had a question mark because it was one of, you know, the comments. And I mean, it can, in my mind, it was like, if, if there's going to be common charging spaces in new developments, um, how is it going to be managed? Now, I am one of those who doesn't like management companies in new developments as a pet hate of mine. And, I, you know, <laughs> because where they exist, um, those who live on the new estate have to pay additional fees to their council tax. And they don't see why they have to do that. And some of these management companies charge them a few fingers, you know, and the service is poor. So if this is going to be added to you know it's like so who's going to manage those <laughs> that would have to go on with the management company wouldn't it with potentially even more or higher level of charges Does that um, make sense? normally you can tie electric vehicle charge points into each residential property even if they've got kind of slightly off plot parking um, a lot of the schemes that we're already seeing are able to tie this electrical supply into private dwellings. And then obviously the homeowners would do any necessary maintenance. Um, there are also companies out there who will undertake all of the installation and any ongoing maintenance themselves. And they will work with developers to provide that service. Um, I know that the City Council are actually working with a company who will do the whole provision of electric vehicle charge points, plus ongoing management and management and maintenance of those within some of the car parks, for example. So uh, I've actually had a couple of developers come to me and ask, are there any companies out there who can help us with this? And there, there are those organisations out there. They're not linked to the management companies. Right. That I know a lot of residents have issues with, and I have lived on a housing development where a lot of the uh, residents refuse to pay their service charge. Um, so yeah, there are ways of keeping that separate okay. uh, to that charge. Okay, no, that's that's great. That's that's good to hear. Thank you. Um, does anybody else have any questions? Otherwise, I have one or two more. <laughs> I don't see any hands up for now. Okay, I will carry on until I see hands up. Um, now, uh, policy IA, which on the aviation development. Um, now, the my thought was that um, we don't still, well. <laughs> I think what was it says was that uh, criticism is that the county council question implication that aviation would not have a significant adverse impact on the environment. Uh, I kind of support that. Um, simply because right now I am dealing with the uh, Luton Airspace Deployment 6, which is causing a heck of a lot of problems here. Um, and so, yes, um, I suspect, you know, when we looked at this, there wasn't anything like that here, but now there is. So this side of South Camps is struggling with um, aviation noise and pollution. So how do we take that into account going I think, forward? To, to be fair, this policy perhaps has a different um, angle than thinking about those, you know, Luton Airport type type issues. Okay. Um, this, po this policy came into existence because we've got um, various small airfields like Duxford, mm -hmm. uh, which um, are um, used for um, event days and leisure and so on. Okay. And the policy was actually put in place, I think, um, in one of the earlier local plans in around, I think it goes back to about 2004, where it was important to put a framework in place to allow applications where they were seeking to 
um, increase use to enable them to have a proper framework and policy in place so that the impacts of those uses could be um, properly considered by the, the planning committees. And that really was the aim of this policy to continue to effectively maintain a framework to allow the committees to appropriately consider those types of issues. It wasn't really the aim of the policy to be thinking about those Luton Airport type issues, I guess. <laughs> that was its that was its real aim. Okay. Okay. So it's just that that, that immediately raised um, you know, the alarm bells in my head really. Um yeah. especially when civil aviation is also involved and they're involved in this and they're ignoring the problems. But anyway, that's another <laughs> that's um that's another situation, I guess. Okay, well thanks for that clarification. Um what's your thoughts on having smart localized energy systems as the norm as suggested by one of the uh, responders it would be lovely <laughs> um i would question at the moment whether it would be viable at all scales of development um we're certainly seeing lots of discussion around things like microgrids that sort of thing coming forward, but it tends to be on larger developments and particularly where you've got landowners with a long term interest in the sites because it what does require. What sort of site are we talking, talking quite large commercial <laughs> developments at the moment, kind of research park type things. Oh, um, right. I think there might be smaller okay. developments that do want to look at microgrids. I mean, we've certainly seen that sort of thing on individual houses, for example. Um, but I think it would be challenging to require that for all scales of development, because it normally needs a certain level of specialist input, which not all developments will have access to. Um, so it's certainly something we can encourage. Mm -hmm. um, but I think we would find it quite difficult to set a very low threshold for that. But I wouldn't rule it out. I think we can have some encouraging words in the policy that, you know, would say that we would welcome that, that sort of approach from all scales uh, of development. OK, as long as we can encourage that. Yes, like absolutely. You know, as time goes on, we see how things are. And then when we need to review the plans and strengthen it. Yeah. Um, as as and when needed. Mm -hmm. I mean, the um the bond quarter, which is actually next door to me here, they've actually put on all their buildings. They've got um solar panels, and when it's all going, it can actually power the buildings. Yes. So I guess that sort of thing is what yeah you know, what we're trying to okay. And obviously, as well, our emerging net zero carbon <laughs> policy as well is going to require renewable energy generation on pretty much every single development as well. So you will see an element of that coming forward, um, assuming we, we get that policy um, approved as well. So all homes will be, well, all buildings will be looking to generate as much power as they would actually use in a year. Okay. So that will come through as well. It's then whether you can connect all of those up and kind of make smart grids and it's where it all gets a bit technical. <laughs> okay, all right, that's fine. Um, I see Councillor Thumbra has got her hands up. I'll come back with something else, but yeah. Oh, yeah, just following on from that, I know in Cambridge there is a group of flat owners where they have six flats and they're looking at putting in solar panels and a mic as a microgrid. So it's not just providing electricity for the common areas, it's for individual flats so they've got a shared uh storage and it's it's a really sustainable thing because you should you want to be using the electricity while it's being generated and if you these are each flat benefits and as so it it kind of it people have different life patterns so it, it's used more efficiently so if if it can be done retrofittedly then it we should be looking at these on new homes and i also in Cardiff, they're looking at putting retrofit as a retrofit, putting it in one street, a micro community heat network. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, again, again, if we can do these, we need to do it. Ret we need to retrofit a much bigger problem than the new build. But yeah. if we can, if they're doing it in retrofit, we can do them in uh, new builds as well. Thanks. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thanks for that. Um, I think my 
final points probably will still be on this energy infrastructure master planning. Uh, did you say Persimmon sort of argued that the outcomes of energy master plan should be part of the viability assessment? Yes. Is that something that is viable to use? <laughs> no pun well, intended we, there. We are going to be doing a little bit of further work, actually, um, which will feed into our viability assessment, which is looking at um, what are the demands generated by the growth envisaged in the local plan and what additional infrastructure will be required. So we can certainly do a high level assessment of what infrastructure do we need to support growth? Where are the areas where reinforcement might be needed? Bearing in mind some of that has already now been funded. So we've got funding approved for two new pieces of grid infrastructure to the south of Cambridge, which is going to meet a lot of the forecasted growth for the south of Cambridge. But we will do some additional work to look at the other areas to see what sort of need would we be looking at? What would be the cost of providing that infrastructure? That's also going to feed into some wider work that's being done on a Cambridgeshire local area energy plan as well, which is going to look at this issue across the whole of the county. And that will give us an initial indication of costs, which we could potentially factor into. We could look to factor into our viability work. The energy master plan would then take that work and look at it in a finer grain of detail. So they'll have a lot more accurate information on the mix of development, um, the sorts of demands that could then update um, and factor into the kind of like the developer viability work to look at what they might be required to pay mm. to upgrade the infrastructure. Um, and the local area energy plan as well, that is also going to look at some different ways in you in which you could fund some of this infrastructure as well. Um, and it will look at things like, you know, potential for forward funding some of right. this infrastructure. Well, forward funding will be important considering yeah. <laughs> what, uh, you know, what the proposed um, plan is for infrastructure levy. I mean, the way it works at the moment is once a developer has got planning permission for a site, they will then make a connection application. And that is when they will find out how much they might need to pay for their connection. And we're trying to bring some of that work a little bit further forward. So we've got an idea kind of at the strategic planning stage, how much some of that will cost. OK, because uh, that makes sense. And the, the other infrastructure that you know needs uh, to come forward, I think, is on the digital infrastructure. You know, uh, broadband. I mean, every, <laughs> the, the, considering what this area is, our broadband uh, provision is um, is a bit on the poorer side. But that's my view, anyway. Um, Councillor Fumbro, again, can I give Simon Smith a uh, a chance, <laughs> and then I'll call call you again, okay? Uh, that's very gracious of you, Chair. Thank you very much. Um, I think we do need to refer to the elephant in the room around um, infrastructure, planning, investment and delivery. We're operating, it's kind of like one of those broken Britain models that was designed to pro generate profits for investors and low costs for consumers. And it's no longer fit for, par for, for purpose. So for the uh, UK power networks to invest in um, the two new grid reinforcements, which were promoted by the GCP, they had to refer to a special fund. So it was like, a, so rather than addressing the fundamental problem about what the new purpose of these utilities should be, there's a kind of, no, we're sticking with the old model, um, the market neoliberal you know, model, um, and we're just going to put sticking plasters on it. And we're not really ever going to resolve this through, a, you know, albeit very worthy local, inter, in, uh, you know, interventions and initiatives. Um, yeah. It's got to be done at a national level. And it, reply, and, it, and it applies to buses and it applies to water and it applies to power. And yeah. That's what we're actually faced with. And we are in the Greater Cambridge area at the epicentre of the problem because these are going to require substantial investments to support the forecast 
growth. So that wasn't a question. That was um, what Councillor Dick does, which is a speech. <laughs> <laughs> Councillor Dick, I will leave you to make a comment on that or come back if you want to. Um, Councillor Bambro. <laughs> Uh, I was just going to say there was a mention about green infrastructure, um, I think, in these slides. And although we've had biodiversity and green spaces, but um, mm -hmm. I'm it is it is so incredibly important. You know, the biodiversity emergency is at least as bad as the climate emergency um, doesn't. And I'm I think we should I think the more the focus we have we can put on it the greater. I think the um, green infrastructure proposals, which is the plan with different areas around Cambridge that we've got in the emerging local plan is absolutely fantastic. Um, and it was the first time I think there was a call for green sites. I think that's absolutely brilliant. But I think how we how we ensure that, that those are right, how they, that fits in with the nature recovery network, which is only going to be advisory, not mandatory. How can we ensure, this is maybe not to be answered today, but just we need to ensure that somehow we do deliver these and they, for, they form part of our open space policy. It's, it's part of a policy to relieve pressure on triple SIs. It's about um, enhancing the River Cam corridor. All of, So it's it, we've mentioned it, but it's I think it's really important. Thanks. Jonathan, did you want to come back on that? Well, only um, we've gone through a whole uh, a list of really important issues, which yep. you know we've highlighted um, through our first proposals and some great comments today from from members, which we'll take away. I guess the other issue we've got to do as officers, whichever system we're working in, we've now got to do uh, deliver you an infrastructure delivery plan, mm -hmm. uh, which is intended to show how um, all the requirements that the policies uh, would bring about. Um, can be funded and then we do also need to produce uh, a viability plan because the, we are required to show that our plan is a deliverable one so we'll certainly try and seek to deliver all these policies but we will hope to bring you uh, and explore those in detail to show you know can they be delivered if there's compromises to be made how do we we make those and come back mm -hmm. to you with that detail at our next stages okay uh Thank you very much. I think actually that brings us uh, to the end of the meeting today. I just want to say thank you very much uh, to all our officers for the uh, great work that you've done and you, you carry on doing. Um, very uh, appreciative of, of all your work. Um, and also for me, I just want to say thank you to Councillor Fumbra for uh, chairing the last two meetings um, whilst I was away and for uh, Councillor Sanford stepping in as the vice chair. Well, that uh, I think draws our business to a close for the evening. And this is the last meeting of this cycle um, for the uh, joint uh, local planning advisory group. We don't have a date yet for the next meeting, um, but obviously we will <laughs> we'll make that public once, once we know, um, you know what the next cycle is going to be. So once again, thank you everyone uh, for your time this evening and um, enjoy the rest of your day and week. Thank you. Thanks everyone. Thanks everyone.